So should I go back to uh, sharing the screen? Yeah, please. A little bit, uh, Kiran. The... So I will. Uh, yeah. yeah. We'll give a small recap in one or two minutes. Then maybe, we'll... maybe, maybe someone. Yes, no problem. So, should I begin? Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Over to you. Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So, uh, thank you, Professor Parthasarathy, for a wonderful talk. So, uh, before the next session, uh, we'll have a small recap of the first session, and then um, we'll start the second part. So, uh, Professor Parthasarathy uh, gave a talk on constructability. So, it in a way forced us to have a relook at uh, relook at our geometry boxes and. Uh, uh like think about what we studied in our schools so uh, how do we relook through uh, modern or what the advanced topics that we have studied after our school so uh, he attempted to clear the mystery around surrounding the constructability and geometry in very simple and uh, non technical language and i uh, believe that it will be helpful to many uh, undergraduate students so uh, his main goal is to uh, discuss the classical constructability problems of the greek geometers through uh, modern algebra so though the explanation was simple and uh, non technical he never compromised on the rigor of uh, mathematics so uh, just to have a recap so uh, the uh, greek geometers did not have any idea of length so uh, the geometry that they had it's called synthetic geometry compared to the modern geometry that we study and which is known as the metric geometry so in metric geometry we don't distinguish between a segment and its length so as professor uh, parthasarathy gave an example so given a circle we do not distinguish between the radius of say 5 cm and the length of the radius which is again 5 cm so uh, uh he showed us how the greek geometers uh, used their uh, instruments so he showed us the uh, the collapsible compass which uh, compared to the modern compass it will collapse once we leave it or we, once we lift it off the paper and the other one is the straight edge uh, without any uh, length marked on the edge so using those two instruments the greek geometers were able to construct almost every figure that we know today so uh, the greek philosopher at that time plato so he said that this uh, the geometry that one could uh, do using only those two instruments is the pure and sublime geometry and consider everything else to be inferior so uh, he then attempted to show that the greek uh, divider and the compass can be uh, made equivalent with the modern compass that we use today so uh, so uh, he gave an example so which which is known as the compass equivalent theorem so uh, uh, what the modern compass can construct in one step he showed that the greeks were able to construct it in four steps using the unmarked ruler and the collapsible compass so uh, he gave us four steps of uh, nested constructions so uh, basically the idea was the greek were able to transfer the length of a segment to a ray using those four uh, constructions four steps and basically achieve the divider at the end so uh, the last part of the talk he uh, discussed and uh, which is on the screen right now there are four problems that the greeks were not able to uh, construct in their geometry and uh, interestingly and more importantly he formulated those problems in the correct form that one should understand before attempting to uh, solve these problems okay so uh, now that's all i welcome uh, professor patasarathy 
to start his second lecture professor thank you thank you kiran that was an excellent sum up i should say fantastic very good thank you, thank you sir so so now let let me let me uh, take it up from where i left it so these are apparently the four problems that were found uh, difficult not uh, easy to solve at that point of time and people for years as i told you for ages actually some few hundred years mathematicians all over the world were trying to solve them but right now what i will concentrate on is to see how this can be solved if i do not bother to restrict myself to the dictums of plato that i am not permitted to use anything other than a straight edge and a compass if i don't bother to maintain that restriction then i can do the exact constructions it's not measurement no no measurement no mensuration geometry purely geometric exact constructions can be done so i'll show you some methods don't give proof for all of them they'll be very lengthy i'll give references you can try it yourself later some of the proof i'll show you some of the proofs are really really difficult that takes large time i'll give you the references at the end of the talk or maybe at the end of the day today where you can see the greater details i'll basically show the construction methods but before that out of these four problems later just going ahead of myself for the timing i'd like to draw your attention to the fact that first three is in one particular class and the fourth one is actually in a different class this uh, the word uh, this class i am not going to explain right now you will come to know about it later in the latter period but let me just share with you this much you see that here the fourth problem the construction of a square as i already have told you the problem actually problem uh, poses the challenge of constructing the length of root pi by ruler and compass construction whether exact construction just like you know construction of root 2 or root 5 you can manage by ruler and compass construction but what about root pi can you do that that was the challenge and you see as i told you without proper understanding of the problem many people some of them are real great genius they have attempted to solve this problem and ended up those who were not competent enough they ended up with wrong proof and those who were genius they ended up with good approximate construction but that's not the essence of the problem and i'll show you one such great name who attempted to solve this problem number 4 and ended up with construction methods which are not geometrically exact construction but some approximate construction and he also gave the uh, level of this uh, approximation uh, the great name of course is srinivasa ramanujan and that that is uh, his own handwriting there you can see at the top left side of the screen that is from his notebook one i happen to have the copies of uh, both of his notebooks published by tifr so there i have found this and this is actually uh, the right hand side one is a picture taken from the book of galois theory by ian stuart so you see where it is connected if you think in terms of higher mathematics where it goes actually this this problem features in the book of a galois theory tells you the level of abstract algebra involved in understanding or deciphering the impossibility of these things that i will come to tomorrow and believe me i will not talk about any formal jargon of any galois theory or anything we don't require that to understand specifically this much right so i am not underestimating those uh, you know galois theories or field extension uh, i am myself is a student of algebra but for particular understanding of this problem i think i can bring it down to much lower level and make things easier to understand without getting into the technical jargons of field theory so here i uh, see uh, one construction by uh, ramanujan and uh, there you see uh, the other one this is from his notebook 2 you know notebook 2 was rewritten by ramanujan uh, you know that is uh, the first one as you can see is a kind of scribbling you know kind of scribbling and the second one is uh, much more formally written where he was trying to impress people by what he has done so that people can you know give him some sort of uh, a little bit of uh, scholarship or maybe uh, any any odd job somewhere maybe a private tuition this is the time when ramanujan was cooking up his uh, you know this is good handwriting nice handwriting just to impress people that this is what i do i i am i am not a failure complete failure i do mathematics so please help me out that was the time when ramanujan was going from door to door 
but that's a different story altogether perhaps you know but this this uh, i think uh, i must connect with this one because uh, this this year you know this is the 100th year of uh, sad demise of his untimely demise of uh, srinivas ramanujan and just few days back on 22nd we have observed this national mathematics day uh, he he left us exactly 100 years before on 26th of april anyway so uh, no point in getting into the details of because that is not in the spirit of the talk that we are trying today uh, you, you can just check the steps that is given in this uh, language by in the book of Ian Stewart, where Stewart actually asks you to prove it that this is approximately the same as the circle, is a quite involved construction, and uh, you, you can you can just read it out. It involves a particular value of pi somehow because ultimately the approximation is going to be on the approximation of pi. As I have already shown you, it amounts to the construction of the length of root pi somehow. So what kind of pi you are using if you want to do the exact construction? Ultimately, you are not being able to do it because you don't exactly get the value of pi. At the end of the day, there, there is the crux of the whole story. So what kind of approximation Ramanujan used? As you can see here, there is a value of pi he suggested. With that, he thought that he could almost get the equal area. He was sure that it's not exactly equal. He maintained that. He mentioned that as I'll show you in the next slide. And this uh, peculiar uh, construction method is given there. Uh, it, it, I have given you reference. I don't think it's uh, worthy of, you know, uh, showing you steps because ultimately this is going to be something approximate and that is not in the spirit rather what i am trying to impress upon you here is this even the great ramanujan he actually missed the point with the idea of modern algebra with the idea of the proper formulation of the problem a mathematician should not have attempted to solve it because it is not solvable it was beyond his understanding. He thought that he can give a construction which is almost accurate and that is a good enough mathematics for that. Well, with modern approach, we don't accept it as a good, it's, it's approximation, ultimately. Whether well, good approximation or bad approximation is a question of, you know, uh, you know, it's a re relative term. Ultimately, it is not constructible. That's what is now justified, proved by modern algebra. That requires some from Greek time, some 2000 years to establish. But I just wanted to show you this, that the attraction of these problems was so much that people around whoever was uh, thinking about mathematics, they got attracted to this apparently simple, apparently simple sounding problems of this particular four Greek origin, right? So let us not get into that. I'll just I'll just uh, show you the, his own handwriting that itself in itself is fantastic to see how, see imagine Ramanujan himself at a point of time writing with this black pen on this piece of paper, what he has done, he's drawing this and writing it out there. And there he writes RD, that is ultimately after the construction, he suggests this particular length as I'm trying to show you on the screen, this RD, it's a very involved construction. And finally, he uh, suppose he, he, he shows that this RD squared that, that means this RD is going to be the side of the required square, which will be uh, of uh, almost same area of the circle. How almost? This is a measure that he gives. RD is one hundredth of an inch greater than the true length if the given circle is 14 square miles in area. If the circle is 14 square miles in area, if this pi r square is 14 square mile, then this RD that he has constructed is actually, according to this, if you do that construction on that 14 square mile circle, the required RD is 100th of an inch greater. That's how good his approximation is. That's his idea of, you know, getting as close as possible to the construction. But again, again, with all due respect to this great genius, he was missing the point. The point of the problem has never been to find as close as possible some approximate solution. The point always has been mathematically, geometrically, whether an exact construction is possible or not, right? So just to get into the other part of the story, that is how these trisections are possible, how these things are possible. So here I show you one method suggested by Archimedes, the great Archimedes. Now this is called Neusis construction. I'll just explain you Neusis first and then just let the construction happen in front of you. I'll, I'll give time, I'll just repeat it once again. Let me tell you what Neusis is. Neusis is what it's called a marked ruler. So you have seen this uh, ruler, right? That I have shown you. 
It's completely unmarked. Now, Greek geometers were using, at a later stage, they were using to circumvent this problem, a marked ruler, marked not in the sense that you see today, not all these. One particular length was marked on it, a fixed length. Two marking that shows one particular length and using that length and using this ruler to slide around through certain particular point or rotating it, fixing it at some, some point, they could manage some more constructions like this angle trisection that was not possible by the ordinary straight edge and compass. They are using now straight edge, a compass, and this is what they call nuisis, which means a marked ruler, means one particular length is marked. So see how that helps in angle trisection. This is brilliant, this fantastic construction of angle trisection by Archimedes himself. So allow me to repeat the construction right from the beginning. So what I do is this, just wait, let the, let the slide go to the first, first part. And then it is so beautiful, so simple. Only try to appreciate the step where this is done, the nuisance. So see this arbitrary angle X is given to be trisected. What do you do? You just extend this to the opposite side, any. And then with any radius, you draw this semicircle. And then this is the radius R and this is X. And then mark this radius R on your ruler. That is now a nuisance. Now make this ruler pass through the point P and slide it in such a way that this portion, as you can see the blue portion, is actually of the same length as R. Then this angle here constructed is Y and that Y is claimed to be one third of X. That is angle trisection. Why the proof is here? It's a very simple proof. You just join R and O. So this is uh, same radius R. So this is, I mean, uh, isosceles Y and Y. So this angle is twice Y. That makes this is isosceles as well, R and R. So this is twice Y. So twice Y and Y, that's thrice Y should be equal to this X. This is the exterior angle and interior angle theorem of uh, ordinary geometry, triangles sum of two uh, interior angles and uh, equal to the exterior angle there. So just repeat, just repeat it and follow step by step. So arbitrary R and this is the new sys. You make it pass through the point P in such a way that this length is exactly equal to R, the point here on the semicircle and on this line. And this angle is claimed to be one third of X. The proof is this, you join this R and O. So this is Y and Y because both of them are R. So this angle, exterior angle is twice Y. If this is twice Y, this is R and R, then that should be twice Y. Then look at the large triangle. This is Y, this is twice Y here. So this X should be thrice Y. That means Y is one third of X. So that's a beautiful, simple, elegant construction by Archimedes. Only this is not ruler and compass because your ruler here is not a straight edge. It's a nuisance where a specific length is marked and you are using that marked ruler to adjust and get this construction done. So using nuisance, Many other of those four problems, I'll show you using nuisance, you can manage the construction you, because nuisance opens up angle trisection. Some other constructions become also possible by nuisance. But before that, another construction of this is called Tomahawk. This is angle trisection construction. That's another beautiful construction of angle trisection by this machine. This is called Shoemaker's Knife. Perhaps you have seen it uh, in the hand of shoemakers or cobblers. This, this, uh, this one at the top left side, you see this is the uh, sharp knife edge and this is the handle where the shoemaker, this is actually inverted. This, uh, the way you see it is a kind of inverted of the actual original thing where this uh, lower part is the handle which the shoemakers, you know, they grip it here and then press it like that to pierce through to cut the you know, requisite part of the, you know, shoes or uh, the tanned uh, things, etc., etc. So what I use it here is for trisecting an angle. So this uh, Tomahawk has a mathematical uh, construction. What is it? This you can see is a semicircle here. And this is this line, this, uh, this length of the line is absolutely arbitrary. It can be any length. The handle, the handle length can be anything, but there is a restriction, mathematical restriction on this sharp edge side. This sharp edge here is extended exactly as the radius of the semicircle. So this is just three equal parts on the sharp side, right? So that's the construction of this machine. These are three equal sides. If I call it R, then this is R, R and R. But this length is simply arbitrary. This length can be extended or reduced, doesn't make any difference. The handle length. And instead of handle, their actual thing is a handle, but we will use only this particular line, which is tangential 
which is mathematically that that's what I require the line that is tangential to this semicircle at the end point. Now there is an angle given. See, this is an angle B A E, and how this tomahawk is to be adjusted so that I get the uh, angle trisector. This is simple. Make this uh, line, this, uh, this is the tomahawk you can see there. This is the radius R, R, and R. So it, you just place it in such a way that its end point, one of the sharp end point is on one of the arm of the angle. And this is made to pass through the vertex. This line is made to pass through the vertex and then you rotate it and adjust it in such a way that the other arm is tangential to this semicircle. And this arm lies, its end point lies on this arm. So just adjust, rotate, slide, and adjust the tomahawk in such a manner that this happens. The mathematical configuration is this. Clear? Look at the configuration once again. This is static, so it should not be any problem. So you make this uh, line pass through this vertex A, and these are three R, R, R. These are the three parts of the sharp edge. The end point lies on one arm of the angle. The other side, you just slide and rotate in such a way that this semicircle become this is this other arm become tangential to this semicircle that means it's a right angle here and then if you join this center this this midpoint here r r and r so that's the midpoint here so you join it here so this edge this arm of the tomahawk and this line joining these are the three trisectors of this angle the proof is simple proof is absolutely class uh, eight nine affair you can see the proof in front of you, right? These two triangles, these two triangles that I'm showing you, this is right angle here, this is right angle here, right? So this is R and R, so right angle and the hypotenuse is common, so this is RHS congruent. So you see that these two angles here are equal. Then you take the second triangle with the third one in this side, there this is right angle again, and this one also is right angle. So this is now R and R, the common side, this side is common, so this is actually in spite of having a right angle, this is actually a SAS congruence. The triangles one and two, they are RHS congruent. The triangle two and three, they are SAS congruent. So apparently clear that all these three angles are equal. So that's the angle trisector by Tomahawk. This is a beautiful method again. Now use uh, another machine by Archimedes to duplicate the cube. As I told you, duplicating the cube, the challenge was to do the construction of the cube root x cube equals to two, then you have to do construct the cube root. So instead of two, if I start with some arbitrary length A, that's the length of the original cube of one side, A. So its volume is A cubed. I want the volume to be twice A cubed. So I want such an X for which X cube is equal to twice A cubed. That's my mathematical formulation. I repeat, A is the given side. I want, uh, cube which is double the volume of it. So its volume should be two A cube. So I want an X such that X cube is equal to twice A cube. I want to construct that X, to get hold of the length X. And this is the machine suggested by Archimedes. So you see, this is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, sliders. These are two horizontal and vertical sliders that can move freely through these hinges. And uh, this is a thing that you make first. There's a right angle. This is the length BG. This is the length BG, the required length of A. And this is exactly twice of that, twice, and then you fix these two on this hinge here by screw and make these sliders move and adjust themselves to make this configuration. So this configuration gives you certain uh, similar triangles, as you can see. And these similar triangles, their side being proportional, you are using that, and you get this relationship. A by X equal to X by Y equal to Y by 2A. That's as simple as that, I repeat. And then you solve it. Get rid of y, you get the required length x, which is the required length because x cube is equal to twice a cube as this relationship shows. So you just, this is a slider, this is the mechanism, and then you have this done. You construct this, make this engineering yourself, fix it here by screw, this much is length a and this much is length twice a, and then make the sliders move in such a way, that is the unknown length you find, that's x and call this length y, and then use the similarity of these three triangles that you see. That x is the length, because a by x equal to x by y equal to y by 2a, you just get rid of y, simplify, and you see x cube is equal to twice a cube. So that's the length x. That's the genius of Archimedes, finding x by a machine.
Certainly not. Certainly not the ruler and compass construction. But the point is, it's not beyond them. Getting hold of that segment was not beyond them. But it was beyond by ruler and compass construction. That was, that was the challenge always. Even when people knew that, okay, it has been done. People still stride. Still that particular time when algebra came in. And algebraization of these problems were done. And by using the algebraic tools, it was proved that such things are impossible. This is beyond the competence of these two machines, ruler and compass, the unmarked ruler and compass. That has to be algebraized first. But that, that's the second part of the story. Maybe I'll take up tomorrow. So today, I, th I think this is clear. It's another, another interesting method by Q finding cube root, right? Finding cube root is the challenge. So there is a method by using mark ruler, nuisis, nuisis construction of cube root. There you see it. So I'll explain the construction step by step. This is quite, quite interesting. So this is from the book of Hartshorn. I'll give you the reference. Euclid and Beyond, that's a beautiful book. And there you see this construction method. So what is the problem? So we have a number A and a unit length one, whether, I can construct cube root of A geometrically. That's my challenge. So begin the construction by the segment AB with length A. Can you see it here? AB, the arbitrary segment AB with length A. You take a line along that. And on that, you mark this length AB. Fine. Using the unit length, you determine a length B such that this B is of the form 2 to the power 3K minus 1 and B is greater than A. Of course, this that means the first such B that you should take. See, 2 to the power 3k minus 1, you put k is equals to say 1, then this is just 2 to the power 2. So that's 4. You are constructing 4 is a number of this form. But if your 4 is greater than a, then you just work with 4. Don't go beyond that. See, the language is a bit confusing here. It doesn't mean that all possible b's are uh, choices. You, you just take the first such b that you take of the form 2 to the power 3k minus 1, and it crosses the length of a. That is your choice of b, and accordingly you get the unique value of k corresponding that will be required for the construction. So now we have a length b of this kind. It is greater than a. And this b is a number of the form 2 to the power 3k minus 1. So that I can construct using the unique length by repeating it. I'll show you that that's simple. That can be done very easily by ruler and compass. Just repeating unit length and getting this integer integral length there. So now what I do, I construct an isosceles triangle ABC with AC and BC equal to b. So mind you, this was a. And this is the new length B. So A, C, B is constructed, an isosceles triangle. Extend this C, A to a point D, such that this much is also B. So this is the construction done. And then draw the line D, B. You draw the line D, B there. You draw the line D, B and extend it so that it intersects. No, it's not intersect. That's just, just extend it. And then comes the nuisance. Now you use your mark ruler. Now on the ruler, this length of B is marked. And you make this ruler pass through the point C and slide it in such a way that this, that this EF, this E is a point on this extended line, the line DB that is extended. So from that point to a point on this extended AB, this length trapped between should be B. Accordingly, through C, you slide it and adjust it. And then with C as center and C a radius, you draw this circle. Automatically, you get another point H here. That much is also B. C is the center of the circle. And with this construction, with this construction, you get two segments. One is this BF, I call it Y. And other is CE, from C to E. Don't confuse, it is not CG I'm talking about. It is C to E, the point on this extended line DB, that is X. So this is X and this is Y that I got. And then I use some known results of geometry. First result that I use, it's called Menelaus theorem. Menelaus theorem, uh, I just go to the next slide explaining you the Menelaus theorem. Menelaus theorem is this. So you have this A, A, B, C, that's, uh, you can see there. A, B, C is the, sorry. so. Okay, ABC, as you can see, is the uh, triangle, and this is a kind of transversal, cutting through it, this point E, D, and F. Menelaus theorem tells that if you 
take the signed length of the segments, then the theorem says AB, that's the statement over here, AB by FB is equal to, uh, into, into BD, there, BD by DC and CE by CA, the whole product is equal to minus one. There's an equivalent formulation. This is, mind you, this important thing is the signed length, right? So you just adjust the nomenclature, signed in the sense AB and FB, they are considered of opposite sign. If F lies between A and B, then AF and FB, they are of same sign. But here AF, if is A is to the left of F, or rather equivalently, F is to the right of A, if you consider that positive, then when you call FB, that has to be considered negative. That's it. So it can be proved. The proof is there in the standard text, or you can go to the internet, Menelaus theorem, your proof is there. I require only the result. So I'll just using that, okay? The result I'm using is a variant of that, which is also given here in the slide. Instead of using the names in the form of AF by FB, if I go by FA by FB, then the sign changes. And ultimately this is equal to one. That particular form we will be using here in our figure. So this is my triangle here, CAF. Can you see the triangle here, CAF? And this is the line DB playing that role of the transversal, cutting through the sides at the point B and E and meeting the extended side CA at the point D, just like the previous figure of the Menelaus theorem. And then I have this identity, this result AB by BF, FE by EC, CD by DA, the product is equal to one. Now I know these lengths, I have designated them by some symbols. So in, 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 in that form, it is A by Y into B by X into 2B by B. CD, you can easily see that CD is actually 2B. This was extended equal in length. So this is 2B by B. So that is equal to one. So that simplify, you get a algebraic relationship. X, XY equals to twice AB. So these are modern construction, right? That's why they are using these kind of things, right? So XY equals to 2AB. Fine. Now there is another theorem that from this external point F, if you have these two seconds, FA and FH in the circle, I don't know whether this theorem is now, now it is taught in school level. I remember distinctly this was taught uh, to me in my additional mathematics syllabus in class 9 and 10. At our time, there used to be uh, in Madhumik level, there used to be an extra subject called additional subject. So mathematics or any other things could have been chosen. In additional mathematics, this theorem was there. There's a very beautiful theorem. It's not difficult. I'm sure you, if you write down the statement, you can prove it yourself. It's not difficult at all. The statement claims that if you take this point outside the circle and you take these two seconds, one is FA, the other is FH, then a beautiful relationship. The uh, area that is made out of these two parts, that is actually rectangles that are being constructed, FA into FB. Can you see that? FA, the whole, into the external part, FB, is same as. FH into FG, very similar. Very pat pattern is very similar. So it, it comes out of similarity and all such things. Again, I'm not getting into the proof of this, rather I give it to you as an exercise. It's a simple exercise, you can find it. But this result I am going to use, FA into FB equal to FH into FG. And then I again translate it in terms of these segments that I have named, A plus Y, so FA, you can see FA, FA is A plus Y, so I just put it here, A plus Y. FB, so FB is Y, so A plus Y into Y, and this is X plus 2B, that's quite clear, FH. FH, the full thing, this is B, B, and X. So this is X plus 2B, and finally this is FG. FG is X, why? You see FG, this much. FG is actually B plus EG. And of course, if you look at from this side, this is CG, which is equal to B again, radius of the circle, plus EG. Right, so CE is same as GF. That's how GF is also X. So I replace this by X here. FG is replaced by X. Then out of these two equation, XY equal to twice AB and this equation, if you simplify, you get rid of X, eliminate X. This is the relation you get. Y cube equals to four AB squared. Now this B has been chosen, has been constructed to be a number of this form, two to the power three K minus one. So you put it there. 2 to the power 3k minus 1 whole square and simplify. What you get is this u y cube is 2 to the power 6k into a. So cube root of a 
will be y divided by 2 to the power 2k. We're taking the cube root of that. So power is 6k here. So what you get is this. That's the cube root of a. y is a known length from this construction. And what this suggests, it suggests that it has to be bisected. How many times? 2k times. So y is to be bisected 2k times to get the length. And bisection is very much within your command. Bisecting a length as many times as possible is very much within your command by ruler and compass construction. So this is possible to get hold of the length of cube root of A. But then again, you have used the nuisance, the marked ruler, the ruler on which the length of B is marked and that you made to slide through the point C and adjusted in such a way that this length is exactly equal to B. And accordingly, you got hold of the remaining things and you could prove it. So well, that's another beautiful construction of Nusi's construction of this mark ruler usage, which shows you the possibility of duplicating a cube. But once again, diverting from the Greek norms, right? And this is there in the page 262 of the book of Hart Sean that I have already pointed out, Euclid and Beyond, the book called Geometry, Euclid and Beyond. It's a very good book for these kind of things. Beautiful things are discussed there. Okay, so this I have already explained. Now, let me talk about the other problem, the th third problem there, the construction of heptagon. Maybe I have five more minutes. So heptagon, as I told you, regular polygons were, uh, they are very uh, interested in drawing the uh, regular polygons and some of them were very easy for them. So regular triangle, that is the equilateral triangle, as you can see the construction, I think it is self-evident. Just drawing this with A as a center and AB radius, you draw it and then, uh, you just uh, B as a center and AB radius, you draw it, that drawing you have already done by collapsible compass. And then you join this ABC, you get automatically, this is all the angles at 60, which you can prove in no time, I'm sure. So this is a equilateral triangle. Fine. This is the construction of regular hexagon. Once again, it requires an angle constructed at the center, which is 60 degree. And then you inscribe it within the circle. That construction is again easy. 60 degree construction, making it equal to the previous the whatever the radius of the circle with the same radius you draw this arc and then join them and you get that angle 60 degree drawn and then repeat that and this is divided in six equal parts that's regular hexagon that is simple this is not that simple this is not that simple this is a there are several methods but i'll show you this is a bit involved this uh, is a regular pentagon construction by euclid I'll give you a paper. This uh, proof of this is a bit involved. Here, Euclid is using tacitly the idea of golden section. The golden section, he is making a golden triangle. And this golden triangle is being used inside the circle. There is a beautiful property of this golden, you know, golden section. Golden section is uh, this, as you can see here on the picture, this is red is to green. That's the golden section. That means this large by small, the large by small is equal to the full, the total by large. If that is the point, large in the thing, uh, this G is dividing this AH in such a way, I call this red. So red by green, this part, the length of red part by the length of green part, it is equal to the total length divided by the red. That section is called the golden section, which is, which is a very celebrated ratio of Greek time, right? So. When you construct a tri triangle, an isosceles triangle, such that two of its sides, the unequal sides, the base and one of the equal sides, they are in a golden section. It's called a golden triangle. So Euclid first constructed this golden triangle. That's a lengthy step-by-step -step method given there. And using that golden triangle inside the circle, inscribed within a circle, he finally accomplished the construction of a regular pentagon. One beautiful property of this golden triangle is that the base angles, you know, base angles must be equal here because it's an isosceles triangle, but the base angles here is exactly twice the angle at the top. So he used that and he replicated that golden triangle as similar to that golden triangle that is being constructed on top. It's exactly, don't think that this exactly was done by Euclid. This was done in several steps. There's a whole paper on that, uh, you know, translating Euclid as was done by Heath and those steps are being deciphered and got this exact construction of Pentagon. So hats off to the genius of these people at that prime age, at that beginning age of human civilization that they could think of such complicated constructions.
but this was done by Euclid. They knew how to construct a regular pentagon inscribed within a circle. The challenge is this, that whether you can construct an angle at the center, which is actually 2 pi by 5. The challenge actually is, as I told you, they used to think of any construction problem in that manner, whether you can construct an equivalent length. So construction of an angle at the center is equivalent to construction of the corresponding chord of the circle and vice versa. So if you can justify that the construction that you have taken records to leads to an angle at the center, which is 2 pi by 5, then your construction is justified. What happens here, this golden triangle, this is a theta, then these are 2 theta and 2 theta, then actually this 5 theta is equals to pi. The first part of the proof lies here in justifying that if you can construct a golden, first of all, the, this one is a golden section construction. The first part of the construction is a golden section construction. It's so divided in a golden ratio in such a way that's, the, that's not very difficult. So assume that this is one unit of length and that is half of that you extend. And then all these uh, you know, paraphernalias are given and you take this arbitrary length to be X and then you simplify and find out that this X actually turns out to be that famous golden section ratio, root five plus one by two, that can be done easily. And then these two sides you use, this is the base and use this length of the other side as the uh, two sides of the isosceles triangle. And the property that you use here of this golden triangle is this, that if this is theta at the top, the base angles are two theta each. So five theta is equal to pi, so your theta here is pi by five. That is so beautifully utilized in the figure below. When you replicate this golden triangle here inside the circle in a different proportion, see that's the golden triangle that is being constructed here. Then again, that property is retained. This angle here, because it's equiangular, they're similar. The angle at the top again is pi by five. So angle at the center on the same chord should be what? angle at the center is twice the angle at the circle. So if this is pi by five, the angle at the center subtended by this length CD should be two pi by five. That legitimizes, that justifies the construction that now this angle has been constructed. The length is the required length of a regular pentagon. You just repeat it five times and they just match each other and you get this regular pentagon inscribed. There are so many others. There is a Ptolemaic construction, which is even uh, simpler, much simpler than this construction. But I have chosen here to show this one because, uh, because firstly, this dynamic animation that I found in the internet is very engaging, very fantastic. Next to that, this involves the great golden ratio. And moreover, this is exactly done by Euclid himself. Ptolemy was a much later person. Period, period of Ptolemy is uh, there. Uh, then Euclid himself did this beautiful construction in his book four of uh, elements. So that they could manage all these things. And not only that, they had the idea that once I can draw an n-gon, immediately I can draw a two n-gon. That was known to them. Why? You know, n-gon means you have drawn the n-gon like you have drawn the pentagon. The immediately you can go to decagon by actually subdividing this angle at the center, subtended by one of its side. You just subdivide it and go to the end point of this uh, internal bisector. Wherever it meets the circle, and you join that, that's exactly the required sides of decagon. So wherever you have an n-gon, you have a two n-gon. So that's how they have three, four, five, six. Immediately they have six, eight, and then 10, 12, but seven was a stumbling block. They had even ingenious, beautiful other uh, mechanisms, just like I, this one I trying to show you. This is a fixed figure. It's not animated. What they are trying, this is this is again in Euclid himself, in the elements. It shows how to construct a 15 gon. See, 15 gon is not uh, possible to achieve by that duplicating sides, dividing, bisecting the angles, because 15 you will never achieve by that way. But he gave this ingenious method. Once you have the idea of a regular triangle, this equilateral triangle and a regular pentagon, he proposes that you draw them with one common vertex on the, within the same circle, inscribe them with one common vertex, as you can see here, A is the common vertex. Then goes this beautiful argument. See this, this is a regular triangle, that means a equilateral triangle. So this arc AC is exactly one third of the whole circle. Similarly, because this AB, etc., etc., is a regular pentagon, the arc AB is one fifth of the whole circle. Is that clear? 
arc ac that's obvious arc ac is one third of the whole circle arc ab is i'm sorry arc ac is one third and arc ab is one fifth right so what is the difference the difference bc its length as an arc of the circle should be exactly one third minus one fifth and that is two fifteenth so what i need to do only from the center i just join bc and subdivide this two fifth the angle subtended at the center by this chord bc or arc bc i just bisect that and what i get at the point here e will be exactly half of that that's one fifteenth and that's how this one fifteenth length if you just replicate 15 times what you get is a regular 15 gone beautiful so they were competent enough but even with this competence they could not manage this this was beyond euclid regular heptagon so i'll maybe can i take five more minutes boys yes sir can take a heptagon construction what yes, you sir. want to cover today you can take Thank you. yeah 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 I, I can i can take five more minutes just showing you the constructions and then i end it here so this is one construction by Francois Viete. this is a gentleman living 200 years before gauss Francois Viete is one of the gentlemen who used these algebraic symbols for the first time this is a new six construction by Francois Viete. so i'll give you the construction it's simple elegant so the new six here is this marked this particular length that you want to be one side of the regular heptagon you mark it on the ruler that's your new sys. this length is predecided whatever you want as the proposed length of one side then what you do is this you construct this uh, square a b c d and with this point c as center and c a as radius you draw this arc and also sorry also you bisect also you bisect this a b perpendicularly and then take this new sys of yours slide it through the point d in such a way that the two ends of the marked length one lies on this arc you have drawn the other lies on the bisector you have drawn then this is going to be one side of the proposed heptagon you can bisect this you can draw another one like this you can bisect that you get hold of the center of the would be circle in which this heptagon will be inscribed and then you just replicate this length of the side seven times and you get again there is a proof of that it can be done all are available i'll give you the references later on there's a beautiful simple construction of a regular heptagon but by using nuces there is another one here tomahawk construction you have we, we don't know what is a tomahawk so you just take this six units uh, radius circle a circle with six units radius and then you divide it in six parts and then go beyond three more parts and then you take this perpendicular the other one and then with r as a radius and six unit here you draw this arc and this arc shows this particular point length is root 27 of course because from r it is one two three units and this is the radius here the, that is the radius here the radius is the same as six units so six units is the length rk and three units or so this much is root 27 then you construct this small triangle here that line is joined so this length is now root 27 here base is one unit so this length pk is root 28 use that with p as a center and this root 28 as radius you draw another arc and then take this tomahawk of yours and trisect this angle p sorry k p l i repeat the construction is again quite involved there's a formal proof in this uh, uh, paper by glisson glisson is a harvard mathematician so there's a formal proof of that if you are interested you can check i'll give you the references see so this is root 27 as i shown that line pk is now root 28 with p as center and root 28 radius i draw the other one i get this angle kpl and that is trisected by the tomahawk right if you remember according to the trisection rule so you join this uh, midpoint of the tomahawk and the other uh, this the, the arm of the tomahawk the red lines they give the trisectors and these trisectors give you the two points at s and t you just join and extend that what is claimed is this length this ab the one you get out of this trisector extended by this uh, line got by the trisector this b and the initial a that's one side of the regular heptagon 
that comes out of this angle trisection. All this proof can be done using a little bit of trigonometry and a little bit of algebra, of course, because these are all modern proofs. All modern proofs. It uses the fact that, you know, these points on the circle, a good student of mathematics surely knows that these are going to be the roots of x to the power 7 minus 1 equal to 0 on the unit circle if you take, right? So all these are being used here, the proof of this fact, but the geometrical thing is absolutely exact in nature. Finally, I will end with the last construction of pentagon. I mean, heptagon, regular heptagon. That's another beautiful construction. This uses nuisance. This uses nuisance once again. This is by someone known as Crockett Johnson. There's a book by him. The proof again is with me if you are interested. So this is how it is being done. First, one unit length taken. So again, this is the length you prescribed to be the length of your would-be regular heptagon. So you start with that length. And that length is marked on your nuisance. This is one. And with that, first you construct a perpendicular here. So this length is root two. Then what do you do? With B as center and root two as radius, you draw this arc so that any point on this arc is at a distance root two from this B. And then what you do is this, you slide your nuisance through this point. So I, I, just, I just wait and come back to the construction once again, the dynamic animation. Let me come back to the step, that'll be easier for you to follow. So now we have drawn up to this arc, which is a radius root two. Uh, just wait for a few seconds, yes. And then come back, come back from the beginning. Okay, this is one unit fixed and then I draw a perpendicular there, that's one. Then these get, get hold of root two. And then I draw this arc with B as center and root two as radius so that any point, and then I perpendicularly bisect this line. And on this, every one is root two. And then I slide my, this is the ruler. This is your nuisance that you make to slide in such a way that some point on this bisector and some point on this arc, this length is trapped, the length of one. And it gives you this, once again, in certain sense, it gives you that golden, golden rectangle, I mean, golden uh, triangle. And that's how it can be proved geometrically that this, is the required construction. So there are no dearth of constructions. The problems that I wanted to show you at the beginning was this, that they must be formulated properly. They are not impossible constructions. They are impossible only when you stick to the Platonian dictum of ruler and compass construction. And I repeat, by no means and standard, this dictum is imbibed as something essential in geometry. In the fiber of Euclidean geometry, it is not essential. You can deviate and you can do the construction. But mathematically, it is a challenging thing, important, because that's what mathematicians always love. So many things can be done. Why not these four? That's why they tried. And that great effort culminated into the algebraization. Once algebraization was done, only then this full stop could have been done. So that is something that we talk about tomorrow in the next class, when algebra comes in, the beginning of modern approach. So allow me to stop here right now. And then maybe your discussion or uh, something. So before going into the question uh, answer session. See, can, can, can you see my, can you see what I'm wearing? Yes, I found yes. something very mathematical for you. You know yes, this yes. gentleman surely, Zoiler, and this is the famous equation, what is known as the most beautiful equation of mathematics as Richard Feynman once pointed out e to the power i pi plus one is equal to zero. Okay, so, so long. For ending today's session, so I just want to announce something. The first talk of our math club is uploaded in YouTube, the Pigeon Hall Principle by Professor Satyanarayan Reddy. So those who have not watched that video, please do visit the Curry Leaf YouTube channel and watch that video. And please subscribe to the Curry Leaf channel to get more in future. And this is for this year and we will meet again in the next year. So by that, by then we will see. Yeah, see you next year. Can we end? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>